mobbed by people. And we said to ourselves, well, this is what it feels like to be a rock star. It became this phenomena that just got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. He rang me up very enthusiastic and said, you must, you must get this boulder and you must make it into a Buddha. I have heard about the Jay Buddha coming back to Bendigo, which I'm very excited to see. I think that it will probably astonish everybody. It's been to 17 countries and seen by over 11 million people. Now, after its world tour, this powerful symbol of Buddhist spirituality has finally come home to central Victoria. Right now is an incredibly auspicious time for us. We have the Jade Buddha after traveling the world for nine years. And just now, it's the great stupa in Bendigo. And of course, it's about to be consecrated and we're about to have an incredible unveiling of the Jade Buddha. For Ian Green, this marks the end of a 15-year journey. In 2003, I received a phone call from an American from California, and he sounded like someone from the movie saying, hey, dude, I've been hearing about this great stupor. And I said, yes, and he said, there's this big jade boulder, and we've got to make it into a Buddha. And I didn't know who he was or what he was talking about. And um, he was a Buddhist as well as being a jade jeweller. And after listening to him for quite a while, I thought, interested enough that we should go to Canada to have a look at this boulder. Surprisingly, Bendigo is home to more than one Buddhist community. In the city's outer suburbs, this backyard shed has been converted into a temple. It's a meeting place for Buddhists from the local Karen community who migrated to Australia from Myanmar. Together today, um, in here to rehearse for the dance, specifically for the light festival of light. The costume is actually very, very bright. It's a way of us to strive in through um, the darkness. So that's why it's, it is very bright. The meaning of the song is uh, about harmony and peace because it is a life festival. The annual Illuminate Festival celebrates the birth, death and enlightenment of Buddha. It brings Buddhists of all cultures and backgrounds together at the Great Stupa.
the form of Buddhism that we practice here in these grounds is Tibetan Buddhism, which is a Mahayana Buddhism. It's really important to me that every Buddhist is welcome here. Beyond that, every member of every faith is welcome here, and beyond that, whether you have no faith, it's everyone's welcome here. There are two main strands of Buddhism. The southern school, Theravada, is strongest in several Southeast Asian countries. The northern school of Buddhism, Mahayana, is traditional to places further north. While some practices differ, Mahayana and Theravada Buddhism share the same core beliefs. Seeking liberation from the endless cycle of birth, death and rebirth to achieve enlightenment. We are Theravada and the, the great stupa is Mahayana. It's only name, it's not really different in our inside. Uh, if we look at our goal, Mahayana Theravada is two, but if we look at our goal, it's just one way, it's to the Nibbana. It's just one, one goal. It's the same goal, but different way. Ian Green wasn't always a Buddhist. His spiritual path had unlikely origins. What we're really looking for here is another name for homogenising. If we've got the product. Advertising was so exciting then in the in the early 70s. It was all sorts of creative people and long lunches and lots of beautiful women. And I really loved it, but then at the same time I realised that it was fairly shallow and there really wasn't a lot of meaning in it. And if I kept living my life like this, I'd end up in a very early grave. So I then decided, OK, I'm going to go to India. I thought, maybe there's an answer there. India was an incredible place to visit. There was so much, so much happening and so much noise and so much dust and so much heat. And after a while, I just felt I needed to find somewhere to relax a park. The park Ian stumbled upon was Sarnath, a pilgrimage site in Varanasi, where it's believed Buddha gave his first teachings. So when I walked into Sarnath, the deer park there, uh, there was something standing in front of me and I couldn't realise it was like a big monolith. And I couldn't work out, is it man-made or, or, or is it like a natural thing? But I could feel this power almost like pulsating, almost strong enough to knock me over. And so that was my first encounter ever with a stupa, and it had a profound effect on me. This experience triggered Ian's conversion to Buddhism and also led to him meeting his future wife. I first met Ian when we were both attending a Buddhist centre in Melbourne, Tara Institute. I saw her meditating in, in, a, in a large room and some, there was something about me that would magnetise me to her. In terms of a friendship, we, uh, we were sort of attracted to each other, I think. Hmm. 
My first impressions of Judy were, were perhaps not so spiritual. Um, I thought she was a very attractive lady. So at this stage we were dating, but we weren't really in a fixed relationship. So I thought, right, this is the time that I'm going to put this proposal to Judy. I'm going to say to Judy, how about you come to Bendigo with me? I wasn't totally that interested at the time. I mean, born and brought up in Melbourne, and I had no intention to uh, leave the city. And at the time, uh, increasingly, I was uh, separated uh, in my marriage, and I had three children. And she then was a little bit freaked out, <laughs> but then she decided she would throw the I Ching. And she'd never seen a more incredibly auspicious answer came out. I remember she came back to me like after that and said, wow, look at this, I've got this incredible answer. I, I, I have to come to Bendigo. He told me that he was coming here to start a, a, a Buddhist centre. So we came to the land and it was basically a whipstick, what's called whipstick forest. Very um, small trees, very dry looking. It was a bit shocking for me. There was no electricity here, no running water. Uh, there was nowhere to live here, so we had to convert a railway carriage into a home and go and get buckets of water to wash in. It was truly pioneer living. Their plans to build a Buddhist retreat changed dramatically when Ian and Judy's Tibetan guru, Lama Yeshe, came to visit. So Lama Yeshe was my spiritual master. And when he came here in August 1981, he walked me around the land here and he said, here we'll build a big stupa. And he drew this thing in the ground like a big stupa. Inside will be a big temple. And then we went for a walk over here and he said, there'll be a village and there an aged care over here somewhere. And up the hill, he said, this is where the monastery will be. So that was the master plan that he laid out in 1981. And so for the past 37 years or so, we've been putting each element of that master plan together. And of course, central to that whole master plan is the great stupa of universal compassion. A stupa has got many, many symbolic elements. In fact, it's a symbol, if you like, an architectural expression of the enlightened mind. So if you look at it from above, it's a mandala shape. And if you look at all the different levels, there is, there is like a meditation to actually go up from one level all the way up to the, up to the very top. At, at the end of Buddha's life, he explained the design of a stupa, a reliquary, to um, you know, to the disciples um, that it was actually a good idea to build a, um, a stupa with a big square base and then you know, tapering up the different levels, and that those levels represent all the stage of the path to enlightenment, and that um, you know, the holy um, remains and, and relics could be kept inside of that. So. It's powerful in it, what it represents, full enlightenment, and because it actually contains the, the relics of um, past masters, past Buddhas, and um, highly realized beings. The look of the stupa at present is about 60% completed. There will be another 18 metres on top of the existing structure, and most of this is highly decorated. And this stupa is also made to last for 1,000 years. 
So it's been engineered, it's been architecturally designed, and it's been manufactured with the highest quality steelwork, concrete, and everything else, so that it will withstand earthquakes, it will withstand bushfires, it will withstand everything for 1,000 years. Now, I know I won't see it finished. There's no way I could possibly do that. It's going to take a few generations to actually see it absolutely completed, but it will be a wonder of the Buddhist world for sure. At the heart of the stupa will be the Jade Buddha. Back in 2003, after inspecting the raw jade boulder in Canada, Ian decided to get some advice from his guru, Lama Zopa Rinpoche. I saw this big boulder and somehow it had an energy about it that, that seemed impressive. So I rang Lama Zopa about it and I said, look, I've just seen this big boulder of jade and I don't know, maybe it's special. So anyway, he didn't say much, but the next morning he'd had this vision or dream or something in the night because he rang me up very enthusiastic and said, you must you must get this boulder and you must make it into a Buddha as a holy object to offer to the world because it will shine a light of peace around the world. Now, my initial reaction then was, oh, I'm already building this great stupa in Australia. Do I really need to now build the world's largest jade Buddha? The Jade Buddha will be just one of the religious symbols featured at the stupa. I'm very grateful for your kind invitation to provide the blessing of the statue of St. Francis of Assisi at this great stupa of universal compassion. Inspired by Francis's passion for peace... It might seem a bit puzzling, that the statue of St. Francis of Assisi is here. But the explanation is very simple. Both in the Christian tradition and also in Buddhism, St. Francis is recognised as a real symbol of peace, of reverence for other people and for the environment in which we live. I have a statue of St. Francis at my altar in Nepal. In a community like Bendigo, interfaith harmony is very important. Placing a statue of a Catholic saint within the precincts of this peace park is aimed at promoting understanding and harmony amongst people of different faiths. Thank you so much. So, so much to all of you for coming. To me, Australia is a multicultural country and therefore we're creating, in a sense, a new form of Buddhism, one that is open and welcoming and sharing with all forms. This is my house. I live in since 2011. And we have a lot of activity in this small place. But from 2011, we have small amount of people, so we have enough space. Now it's not enough because people are growing very quick in Benigo or moving to Benigo uh, a lot. First family that moved into Bendigo was back in 2007, and then a few months later, there was five of them. And then after that, then a lot of other Korean come in to uh, Bendigo, move in here, even in, from other states as well, because they realize that Bendigo is actually a nice place to live in. And then now we are about 1,000 and something. Most of the Karen in Bendigo have settled here from refugee camps in Thailand. <laughs> I feel secure when living in Bendigo. If we are in Thailand or in the camp, you are basically caged in living there in the camp. So it is very hard and not as safe because they, like, people can come in anytime, can kill you, for example, and then there's no police to find the killer. So that's actually very scary. 
whereas here, basically you have to follow the rule to, to, um, to live, yeah. And nowadays they, all, they also have Asian grocery store that you can buy Asian food. So yeah, I feel very, like I belong here now. Yeah. Having a Buddha statue is actually very important to us so that we can pray to and then when we are in groups, when we're in bigger, like in bigger groups, we can see it's actually in front of us, like it's all more obvious. Grace to back. I have heard about the Jay Buddha coming back to Bendigo, which I'm very excited to see. So when we first started to tour the Jay Buddha, I figured like it might last six months, maybe 12 months. But it became obvious from the, the first time we unveiled it that this would, was something different was happening, something unusual was happening that I just didn't anticipate. So it became this phenomena that just got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. We were mobbed by people and we had to have police escorts. And we, we said to ourselves, well, this is what it feels like to be a rock star. There is an expectation that the Jade Buddha is coming. It will probably astonish everybody because it is so magnetically attractive. incredible day for Judy and myself because today we're going to unveil the Jay Buddha Universal Peace. This has been a dream of ours for nearly 15 years and today is the day. Thank you so much for coming. These days when I watch the Jay Buddha unveiled, I don't look at the Buddha so much, I look at the people's faces. And I see when the Buddha is revealed, just their hearts open up and it becomes such a, an inspiring moment for them. So I can see this Buddha really is illuminating the world. I do feel a little teary about the whole thing just because it's so emotional. Because it's like the big culmination of everything to have the Jade Buddha now settle down so peacefully and so beautifully inside the Great Stupa. I'm from California, San Diego, 
And now I come over here to Australia to visit the Jay Buddha. And then I fall in love with the Jay Buddha. And then when I saw him, it's amazing. And how this guy built this rock so beautiful. And I can believe that. See, so that's right for I thought the Buddha was amazing. The piece of jade that it's carved from is incredible. And we've been waiting for this is long, long times, and finally we managed to see it, and we will be so grateful. Me and my friends, we finally have seen it. So we are, we were so close to it as well. So it's such a magical experience. It's like a dream. So finally, there's something tick off on my list. It's been part of my Buddhist journey, really. It's changed me inside. We could have been retired and just playing bowls, um, but in fact, uh, I would have hated that because we're in our early 70s and we have a life that's uh, rich and full and it's given us a direction and a richness in our life that we, we would not have had. We all are attracted to different paths. Buddhism is the path that really attracted me. It doesn't have to be religion, but a spiritual aspect. That's the thing that I think is missing in a lot of people's life. And I think that's what I want, to, want people who come here to remember. Yeah, that's the thing that's missing from my life, the spiritual aspect. And whatever that is, is the path you've got to find.